All right. Well, first off, I just want to say, um, you know, thanks again for for getting back to me and being open to chat and, and share your time. Um, you know, obviously you're a you're a legend in triathlon and Ironman, but you know, much much beyond that as well in terms in terms of a real sort of holistic approach to life, which is really impressive and and also pretty rare when it comes to people that have been or are at the top of their game. It seems like. So thank you. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so I'm curious to sort of just start off uh, chatting a little bit about where you're at right now. Um, where are you living? Are you coaching? Are you out on rides on in the wild? Or are you on Zwift? Uh, you know, what, what do you kind of focus on these days? <laughs> well, that's actually a really good question. I, I'm 63. And so um, interestingly, 13 years ago, when I turned 50, it was kind of like, that was the, the first birthday I woke up and I'm like, holy shit, you know, I am halfway through this journey at least, you know, and so how do I, how do I go forward from here and, you know, maintain good health, maintain vitality, flexibility, strength, peace of mind, a good mind, a lot of those things. Cause I, I you know, it seems like as people age, you kind of, there's like this real division of how people approach it. Some people just sort of give up and other people are trying to reclaim something that they were 20 or 30 years ago. Mm. And it's like, neither of those to me seemed like the right way to do it. It's like, you know, do I want 60 to be the new 40? No, I want 60 to be the new 60. Mm. You know what I mean? So it's like, just because you're aging doesn't mean you go from wanting to be this young athletic, you know, on the cover of magazine type body to all of a sudden you're geriatric, you know, there's a, there's a huge span of time in there where, uh, and I really felt this personally, like if I take care of myself and maybe a adjust or adapt the way that I exercise and take care of my body with nutrition, diet, peace of mind, spirituality, everything, that I can really um, stay pretty vital for a long time. And so I've been working, that's kind of been like the behind the scenes, mm -hmm. what I've been doing for quite a few years now. And I think I finally, especially during COVID because it gave me a lot of time to really bring a lot of elements together. Um, it, I'm ready to kind of like put it out there in the world, but it's, shh, don't yeah. tell anybody quite yet. So anyway, um, <laughs> what am I, what am I doing? I live in Santa Cruz, California. I, definitely coach triathletes all over the world with, through markallencoaching.com. It's a, I've, I've been coaching for almost a little over 25 years now. And uh, I've been in, you know, endurance sports for over 40. So pretty good, pretty good uh, bank of experiences, both personally racing and, and then also helping others get ready for events. Mm -hmm. And um, so I do that. I do, uh, I, I teach a co-teach a workshop with the gentleman Brant Secunda, who really was instrumental in me being able to win so many Ironmans, six six Ironmans. He he teaches a, a tradition that comes from Central Mexico, from the Huichol people. It's a very uh, shamanic, traditional way of approaching life and, and keeping things in balance and honoring nature and honoring your family and community and the earth and very very. Um, holistic way of, of, of living. And that really helped me to um, have that balance I needed when I was racing. Cause you know, as an athlete, your, your world can sort of shrink to having meaning only to a number, you know, what, what was my heart rate? What was my pace? What was my split? What was my placing? You know, did I set a, a PR? And it's like, there's a lot more to the world and to life and to actually achieve those little microscopic things that have meaning to a lot of folks, uh, bringing more of who you are into it enables you to often do that easier than if all you're doing is focus on, focusing on those little things. And so that's how I approach racing. So anyway, he and I teach a workshop together called Fit Soul, Fit Body. And it's based on our book, Fit Soul, Fit Body, Nine Keys to a Healthier, Happier You. And it's really a if you look at the nine keys, it's really, it was, it was the template that I followed to actually become an Ironman champion. And it's a template that anybody can follow no matter what their ultimate goals are in life, whether it's to be more fit, uh, find more balance, live a longer life, find just more general peace and harmony, um, 
you know, there's, there's something in there for everybody. And so we, we love to teach that. We haven't had a workshop in about a year and a half now because of COVID, but we, our next one is coming up in um, September at the Art of Living uh, Retreat Center in Boone, North Carolina. Absolutely gorgeous uh, setting in nature. And that's really great. So that, that's kind of the, what, I, what I do, you know, and personally what I do for athletics and exercise my go-to, I live in Santa Cruz, California, is surfing. You know, I'm two blocks from one of the main breaks and I've surfed since I was young and I, I just love getting out there in the water and it's, you know, it's it's cardio, it's it's my yoga because you're stretching and moving in every direction. It's, it's time in nature, it's time to just daydream, it's time with my community of fellow surfers that, that I've gotten to know over the years and it really, it, it really just feels like it wakes up my spirit and it keeps me young and healthy and um, unlike some sports where they're very um, regimented in a sense, like let's say if all you do is you run, you kind of do the same thing all the time, mm -hmm. unless you you know go out on trails and you're moving and changing and, and it's it's very different that way. But uh, surfing is not like that. You know, no two waves are the same, and so you kind of have this base of knowledge. But every time you get up on that board and start paddling for a wave, it's different. And I think that really is a something that does something to your brain to keep it you know alive and vital and vibrant and you're always always learning so yeah i rambled there but anyway no, that's, that's kind of that's kind of what i've been doing yeah i've only done a little bit of surfing but it's it's the thing that i look at as sort of this one of the most beautiful ways that man sort of comes into harmony with our universe or our galaxy you know like the sun and the moon are making these waves and currents and then for a moment you have to just find harmony with that you know from reading the sea and all the conditions and there's not a lot of things like that in the world that you know it can just be so powerful and just you know that moment of harmony with everything uh is, is it's like a really beautiful sport in that way and it's it's such an amazing interaction with the, the energy of nature. You know, mm -hmm. the wave is an, pure energy. And every day, it's almost like you have to go out there and learn the language of the ocean. What's it? Mm -hmm. How is it communicating to you today so that you get in the right spot and you're, you're there at the right time when the sets come in? And um, so, like I said, that's my go to. But then I also do a lot of things that are really conditioning oriented. You know, I, I, I do a lot of walking now because I think that's you know, here I am Ironman champ saying walking is amazing, but it truly is an amazing exercise and something that is really good for just conditioning your body and keeping it strong and healthy. And you can really, it's, you're moving slow enough that you can focus on the actual movements left to right. And you can feel imbalances and you can kind of correct them on the fly. Like sometimes when you're running, it's happening so fast, you know, something might not be perfectly balanced left to right, but you can't quite figure out how to correct it walking you can do that and so it's it's actually helped me to really feel like i'm keeping my body balanced i also do um a fair amount of strength training nothing you know i'm not pushing huge weights but enough to to challenge my muscles and it that really as i age feels like one of the keys to making sure that ensuring that i can still move that i can still have that integrity of my joints and my tendons and my ligaments and so i i really mix it up you know, I, there's no two days that are exactly the same. And through that, it feels like I avoid digging that rut that can end up in an injury. You know, like mm -hmm. if you, again, I go back to running, but a lot of pure runners, you, you know, you, you do the same thing over time and everybody's body is a little bit, you know, one-sided one, they favor one side or the other. So over time, you can kind of like dig this little rut in mm -hmm. that side that's maybe a little weaker if you're doing the same thing all the time and it can result in an injury. You mix it up with cycling, or I do stationary bike work on Zwift, um, but you mix it up every day, you avoid kind of digging that rut of imbalance and it helps to uh, just keep everything healthy. And if, if you're healthy, you're still moving. And if you're moving, you're still healthy. And if you're healthy, you're happy. And when you're happy, you wanna move more. It's just like this huge positive feedback cycle that happens. Right. It's just getting that flowing and, and going, which can be a challenge for a lot of people, I guess. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, you, you mentioned that you've been surfing for a long time. Um, 
and and then the sort of spiritual side both to sport and life you know i wonder like you know obviously your career path i think is fairly well documented in terms of going to kona and competing for a number of years and then sort of cracking into winning it and then you know being the champion for a number of years after that and you know it's well known that that takes a lot of training cycling running and swimming but what were some of the other things you know i'm curious you know like the other pieces of that puzzle that sort of evolved over time um be it strength training or really giving the sort of mental side of it attention like when did those start to sort of fall into place well the kind of the mental approach or the the mindset approach of how I how I trained and how I raced was something that I worked on from really from the very beginning of the sport. I was a I was a swimmer growing up, uh, but I was very outstandingly mediocre. You know, I wasn't I wasn't a world champ. I didn't even qualify for anything big like Olympic trials or anything. And part of it was genetically I'm not put together to be a good swimmer, but a lot of it was just in my mind. Like if if somebody got just a fraction of a stroke ahead of me, it's like, you know, that little tape would go off and it would go, oh, they're ahead, they're gonna win, they're gonna pull away, I can't catch them, you know, and everything would tighten up. And of course, the scenario plays out. So it reinforces that sort of negative talk that was going on. And when I, th then, you know, I swam till I was 22. And then when I was 24, I saw the Iron Man on television and was just mesmerized by it. And I thought, I need to go there and see if I can do that thing. And so um, without any experience cycling or running, I just launched into it. You know, I had the swimming part. part. Um, and so anyway, uh, Ironman, as you know, is always in October. I started training for it in, in February. And as a 24 year old, you think that's plenty of time, right? So anyway, I did a, a short, uh, an Olympic distance race in June of that year to start to get some experience at triathlon racing. And uh, I actually came off the bike in fourth place, but right away a guy passed me and, and in the first mile of the run. And so, you know, immediately the swimmer tape goes off and it's like, oh, he passed me, he's gonna pull away, you know, I'm gonna get fifth and probably more people are gonna come by. And something in me just kind of goes, wait a minute, you know, is that really what's gonna happen? Mm -hmm. Is there another possibility? Is there a different way of looking at this? And I could just feel this ease come through my, my, my running stride and every, everything started to flow and my mind went quiet. It got quiet and peaceful. And the guy who had been pulling away, all of a sudden he stopped gaining time. And all of a sudden I started to pull back the distance that he had, he gained on me. And then I went on and I passed him and I ended up finishing in fourth place. And um, the first three guys who were ahead of me were three of the best guys in the world at that time, Dave Scott, Scott Molina, and Scott Tinley, all three who won Ironman during their careers. Um, and so on the outside, everybody's like, oh, wow, who's this dude who was in fourth place, you know, behind these three icons. And that seemed, you know, for the outside world, that was what was really interesting. Like, who is this guy? Is he an up and comer? But for me, the real impact of that day was really seeing how the thoughts that, that I would tell myself in the race had an immediate impact on th the performance that I was having. And that maybe if I could shift those negative thoughts in the race into something, it, maybe not necessarily positive, but at, at least just get quiet, mm -hmm. I might be able to have my best race, whatever that happened to be on the day. And so mm -hmm. from that very, very first triathlon that I did, I, I, I knew that this is going to be something that is going to be a strength for me. How I will develop that, I'm not sure at the time. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, eventually halfway through my career, I did meet um, Brant Secunda, and he was a, a tremendous, tremendous key to, to developing that sort of peaceful yet powerful mindset that is kind of that sweet spot athletically. You know, mm -hmm. when you when you have a sense of peace or calm, but at the same time, you can sense um, possibility or your strength or a surrender that says, you know what, no matter how this turns out, I will be okay. And then being free to actually give everything you have in that moment and the next and the next and the next, 
that's how you have your best performance in races. And it doesn't always come together, you know, and it's something that I practiced. You know, for example, people ask me, well, you know, how can I practice that? You know, and I go, well, it's very simple. In, in pretty much any workout you do, if you get to a point where all of a sudden you start whining to yourself, you know, eh, it's too hot, I'm hungry, I should have not done this long ride, these guys are too hard, too, too strong, mm -hmm. you know, whatever it is. <sighs> Take that breath, get into that quiet space, and then you can just feel, you know, that all that negativity just goes like this and it's, it's outside of you and it's gone. And then you're free to disengage. And it's like, maybe you will all of a sudden feel 100% better. Maybe you won't feel any better, but you will feel more at ease. Mm -hmm. And gaining that sense of ease is so important to practice over and over and over. And then when you're in a race and things get tough and you know, guaranteed in every race you do, there's going to be those points where you're just like, ah, I can't do it. You know, whatever you end up telling yourself, uh, if you practice it, you, you in it like two seconds or 20 seconds, you can get back into that sort of flow of just the rhythm of your breathing and the movement and the joy of that movement and knowing that you are giving everything you have. If you have not practiced that and all you're doing is hoping that on race mm -hmm. day you will yeah. be able to do that that's <laughs> like not training going i hope on race day that i can run that marathon even though i haven't run it all you know yeah and it's it's that was a big part of my training you know personally and then doing retreats with brant where he did real focused work to help develop that sense of calm and that sense of trust in life and that more holistic look at things you know like when things are, are going are rough or bad, or you're feeling challenged, sometimes you can feel like my life is going to be death and doom. You know, like mm -hmm. if I don't win this race or if I don't do that perfect time, or if, if I fall apart, you know, my life is going to be death and doom. Well, it's not, you know, you're going to wake up the next day and your friends and family will still love you. The, the trees are still going to bloom in the springtime. You know, the leaves will mm -hmm. come back, the sun will rise, the sun will set, you know, all of those things that are timeless. And when you connect with those timeless things and it, it, it somehow it enables the immediate challenges of this moment to sort of ease a little bit and it feels more approachable and manageable. And, you know, we've all had to sort of weather that kind of situation during COVID, right? Mm -hmm. you know, everybody had to deal with stuff that was unusual and unexpected and out of the blue and situations that could be very, very, very challenging. And so that was a, the perfect time, it still is, to kind of practice some of these tools of just, you know, what can I do here? Instead of focusing on what I can't, mm -hmm. what can I do? What is possible for me to do right here that is a positive, that will have a positive impact on this moment in my life? Yeah. Yeah, I think that is so powerful and obviously applies to every aspect of life and every sort of circumstance as well. I think, um, you know, the intellectualizing sort of like, okay, my family is still going to be here. The world is still going to keep turning. I'm going to be okay. You know, that can provide that sort of momentary shift with a couple of deep breaths, but then there's sort of a deeper embodied feeling of that and experience of that. And I guess as you sort of started working with Brandt and delving more into sort of some of the, the shamanistic uh, processes and really sort of looking within, I'm curious to know on that path, like how that started to shift things and if there was specific um, like events uh, or um, moments, you know, uh, in a sweat lodge or with some drums, you know, some of these, these sort of like ancient technologies that helped you sort of down that path and gain even deeper insights and have more of that sort of embodied feeling of it rather than just thinking it or knowing it mm -hmm. in that way. Yeah, he, you know, he is a shaman in that tradition. He went through a very traditional 12-year apprenticeship to be able to lead ceremonies and do healings in, in a in very traditional way. And, you know, drumming is a part of their culture, chanting is a part of their culture. And so just like pretty much any spiritual tradition there is there is drumming or there is chanting and, and there's that use of sound to help shift your 
consciousness or awareness so that you do have an experience of something other than just this sort of ordinary reality. And that it really helped me to um, be able to, you know, like you said, it, to, to say, you know, oh, I trust my, that my family and friends will love me when I'm done. You know, that's sort of like an intellectual thing. But really what you're trying to do in, the, in those moments is to just embrace whatever it is that's going on. So it's like, yeah, my legs are killing me and this, it's hot and I'm losing, I feel like I don't have enough energy. Instead of trying to push that away, just to connect with it and embrace it so that all of a sudden you feel completely connected to life itself. And that's sort of, I guess, in a very broad sense, what all of the practices that Brandt does and the ceremonies that he leads and the, the, just some of the daily practices that he has us do, it helps you to feel connected to life. And when you feel like you're connected to life, it's sort of like you have this awareness of everything going on around you. And it's less about your personal experience as opposed to you experiencing everything in this earth and this universe and in your community and, and in your family and, you know, with the trees and the seasons and the birds. And um, it's just a beautiful experience. And as, as crazy as it sounds, it's almost like we have to practice being happy, mm -hmm. you know, and the more we practice being happy, you know, finding things that give us that sense of peace and serenity and calm and joy the more that becomes a place that we go to, even in tough moments. It's like, okay, this is a tough moment. This is very challenging, but you embrace it as opposed to going like this, you know, like, yeah. <laughs> stop, I didn't sign up for this. You know, yeah. This is, somebody else should have to deal with this, not me. I, deal, I dealt with this a hundred times in my life. I thought I was over it, you know? Yeah. But, um, and, and he emphasized, he said, you know, life is not about, um, being in this blissful state every second, you know, everybody gets challenged. That's, you know, that's part of, part of life. Mm -hmm. Nobody gets away with a, a hall pass. You know, we all have stuff that we have to deal with in situations um, that arise that are very, very, can be very difficult. And he said, ultimately, uh, you know, this is Brant talking. He says, ultimately, no situation is inherently good or bad. It's just how we respond to it. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, I always, that really ha has stuck with me over the years and it really affected my racing, you know, like in, in a race when it, something was happening that seemed on one level very bad. It's like, this isn't necessarily good or bad. It's just what's going on. So let me deal with it. Let me manage it. Let me get through it and move through it and move past it and get on to the next phase of what's happening on this day. Yeah, absolutely. And it, like you said, it does take practice to bring that level of presence, especially when things get challenging. But I can, you know, when I've been out for runs lately, the last sort of six months or so, it can be hard. And I'm like, you know, not going as fast as I would like to be going, or my heart rate is too high and I'm going, haven't gone really slow, but just trying to remember like, well, at least, you know, I can run. My legs are carrying me across the earth and these trees around me are making oxygen that I can breathe, you know, in those little moments. It's just uh, appreciating some of that magic that we've become so numb to really mm. does help. Yeah, I think, I think COVID taught all of us to be a little more tuned into what is very simple and basic and beautiful. You know, we, we eliminated all of our exotic vacations and we eliminated those peak things called races where it's very intense mm -hmm. and all of a sudden we're replacing all of these huge things that are huge stimulations into our system with very subtle stuff you know you can't go anywhere so you go outside and you're looking around it's like oh it's a nice day you know <laughs> and i didn't realize that i had those flowers in my yard you know that tree has a, a looks like a face in the bark you know whatever it is you, mm -hmm. you notice these things that that were have been there you know forever but maybe just got missed and and it really does felt like it took us all back a, a few notches to like when you're a child and innocent and the simplest things can be the most ecstatic and joyful things to you know experience and to see and to witness and to be aware of mm -hmm. so the trick now is to hold on to that sort of simplicity of awareness and see if we can carry that forward as things come back 
Yeah, that is always the challenge for me, like having done different sort of intensive workshops and, and uh, sort of isolation retreats and that sort of thing, you know, those core messages are always so obvious in those times and so strong. And it's just trying to keep them close and remember them uh, as you get back into life and the emails pile up and all that stuff. It's always the challenge. And then something, you know, seemingly dramatic will come up and it's like, oh, that's the real challenge. You know, can you remember to, you know, stay present and be kind to yourself? Hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I've really um, embraced even more than ever now is to just try to make sure that I go out, go outside every day and just experience yeah. a little bit of what's going on in nature out there to be really aware of the season that it is and how things are subtly changing each day and maybe even just simply how the weather is changing each day and, and to sort of feel a part of, you know, what the birds are singing out about out there and, you know, how the bugs are coming back now that it's springtime and, you know, whatever it is, all that kind of stuff. And, um, you know, Brandy has mentioned, you go, he, he said, even when you're in the middle of a big city, you know, mother earth is still beneath your feet. You know, you're still part of this planet and we're all, as he puts it, he said, we're all children of the same mother, this mother earth. And kind of just contemplating that for a little bit really does put a lot of different things in perspective. It sort of, it, it, it takes away the differences that might divide people and makes me anyway realize we are so much the same. You know, mm -hmm. we all want love. We all want recognition. We all want to be honored for who we are. And maybe what you need to be honored for is going to be different than I do. But at the mm -hmm. same time, you know, we all have these same basic needs. And, uh, you know, every culture smiles. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah, absolutely. And I definitely agree with you. We all are so similar and all of those sort of core needs are, are really the same. Um, you know, for me on my journey, a lot of it has been learning about that and understanding that more deeply. I wonder sort of as you got into triathlon, which takes so much commitment and fire to sort of do something like that, as you sort of began to get to know yourself more deeply and what it was, you know, some of those needs for yourself, I imagine that there's sort of a level of, of self acceptance as well and self sort of love that, that has grown. And I'm curious to know how that sort of affected your competitiveness and, and life overall. Well, one, one piece that sort of addresses that is, you know, my history is, as you know, and probably a lot of people listening, I, I didn't win Ironman the first year that I went there. I raced it six years without winning successfully. And um, I was always being pretty much beaten by one guy, a guy named Dave Scott, who in, during his career won six Ironman titles. And he was one of those athletes that you, you could see him anywhere at any other race around the world and know that he was beatable. And you would see him get off the plane in Kona. And it was like, you know, it was like Conan the Barbarian got off the plane. Like he was like this superhero that just like got pumped up to 150 PSI. And you thought, oh my God, there's no frigging way I can beat this guy. And the way he liked to race was he loved to just control the, the event, control the day, control the pace, everything, you know? And so, you know, I thought, well, if I'm going to win the Ironman, I've got to be like that. I've got to go there and feel pumped up and feel like I'm so strong that I can control everything going on out there. And there's no way that, first of all, that you can control that day. Mm -hmm. Second of all, eventually, after unsuccessfully winning six years in a row, I reflected on the race and I realized, you know what? Every other race around the world where I have gone and raced very, very well. I always go into it with certain race strategies, but at the same time with this very calm surrender, knowing that it probably won't go the way any of those scenarios really mm -hmm. that I have in my mind, it, it, it's not going to go that way. So I have to be willing to just surrender and see how the day unfolds and respond to it as it does. And so, and that's very different than saying, I'm going to control this race. I'm going to be strong. I'm not going to let anybody break me. 
And so I thought in 1989, as I was sort of preparing for my seventh attempt in Kona and getting ready to go to Hawaii, I said, I need to go there as me and not as Dave Scott's imitation. That's how he does well. That is not how I race my best. I race my best when I go see how the day unfolds, manage it as it does, and then come up with the solution of how I'm going to get across that finish line in first place on the fly on the day as it takes place. And so I went to the big island that year and, uh, you know, I got there and right away I went to this um, very sacred place along the along the ocean along Ali'i Drive where the marathon takes place. And uh, I just left some offerings and I just asked the island, I said, hey, let let it be okay that I come here with my strengths, the way that that I am just me. I can't be this other person that doesn't work. And I just hope that you can accept that. And I just really had this feeling like the island opened up and, and, and it embraced me for the first time because I was not trying to push it away either. The big island can be very intense. It's, it's a very strong place in nature. And it just felt like I was surrounded by this warmth of aloha and, and beauty and, and strength that I'd never been able to tap into before. And that ended up becoming the first year that I did win the Ironman. And so, you know, it was, it was a real lesson for me, like, you know what, being yourself, you may not win, but if you're not yourself, you're probably definitely not going to win, you know? And so, like they said, you may as be your, you may as well be yourself. Everybody else is taken, right? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that was a that was a real lesson for me, and that just really I built on that year after year after year from that day forward. Yeah, it's funny because like those sort of cliches are are you know old and and true, but it's it's pretty challenging to do that, you know, to really embrace yourself and to to live that and know that you're going to be safe and loved and it's going to be okay. And it doesn't mean you're going to win necessarily, but it's going to be the most fulfilling way forward. And um, it's something I definitely struggle with, you know, with, with work and career and getting into triathlon now. And, um, you know, there's so many aspects of it. And it's, it's funny in some ways because I've done all this sort of spiritual and emotional work. So I have all this more awareness and can feel when I'm not in sort of alignment with my truer self and when I am, and yet still feeling the resistance to really embracing myself in that way sometimes. Well, I think part of it is first and foremost, understanding who your real self is. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's a search that we're all on, I think for, you know, maybe your whole life. And then w when you see that it's, you're going to see that not every part of yourself is necessarily positive or strong or this amazing thing that you mm -hmm. have weak weakness too, that you have, that you have fear, that you have doubt, you have these things that can potentially hold you back. But like Brant said, you know, everybody has fear. Everybody has, um, everybody gets angry, you know, there's emotions like that, but he said, you don't have to let those things hold you back because they're really not who you are anyway. And, and that's, I think that's the sort of the second half of that whole thing of embracing who you are is mm -hmm. understanding kind of what is your essence, what is true to you. And then also embracing those pieces that need healing or mm -hmm. you're trying to develop or that you look at and you go, Ooh, <laughs> Was I like that with that person or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. and, and uh, evolving those pieces as well, embracing those pieces. Yeah. And I think, you know, it's one thing to do that for ourselves, which is an important journey. And like you said, probably a lifelong one, but as a coach, I wonder, you know, how do you sort of approach that with athletes, especially, you know, somebody who's maybe in their twenties, they don't obviously have the life experience or, or even maybe racing experience that you have, you know, bringing some of those ideas and thoughts to the forefront, especially when something like COVID comes along and takes races out of the picture. You know, a lot of what I did with my athletes this past year was to sort of redirect what had an importance about, about doing this sport. You know, a lot of athletes 
you know, the, the ultimate thing is you're, you're training so that you can race, so that you can do well, you can place in your age group, you can qualify for a Darren man, you know, whatever it is, you can set a PR. But none of that was on the table last year. So all of a sudden I said, well, wait a minute, you know, does that mean you're going to stop training? Mm -hmm. You know, just go out and train and, and be very aware of how that makes you feel and the value of that good feeling that you get from moving your body. Maybe you're not going to do a five hour ride, but go and do an hour and a half ride, or, you know, you're not going to do super hard intervals, but go out and just exercise because you like it and feel the inherent joy and happiness and good health and stress relief that you feel by moving your body. And all of a sudden, all these athletes that I coach who I thought were going to like just bail and, and do nothing, they were embracing their training even more than ever because they, they saw that, yeah, racing's great. Those days, those peak intense experiences are great, but it's this day to day that really enriches me and, and enables me to feel good and healthy and strong and vibrant and stress-free and gives my mind a, a, some time to just relax and be calm and not have to solve problems and do work and think about solutions. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when you have that more holistic relationship with sport, then it becomes so much more than sport. It really does become a, a canvas for life to mm -hmm. really experience life to the fullest. Yeah, absolutely. I think for myself, you know, the last few years has been this sort of developing more of that. And then it came to the point where I was like, you know, I'm, I'm ready to inject some purpose back into this, you know, and, and have some races and try and do something that I've not done before and see how that goes as well. And, you know, having, cause at times it'd be like, you know, maybe I don't feel like exercising today and there's nothing to really like hold me accountable to that, but knowing, okay, well, there's a race, you know, eight months down the road, I'm just going to, you know, put in 1% today. What am I willing to do? And sometimes that can help with the motivation, I guess. But it's kind of a funny, I'm, I feel like I'm coming at it from like a reverse engineered sort of way. Yeah, you know, it's, it, it's more like what, what, what motivates you to be consistent? You mm -hmm. know, ultimately, um, I think there's going to be a, something that you know, it's going to be like a, a real focus on consistency. And so if you need a race to keep you consistent, that's great you know, stick it on the calendar, have that be your accountability. Um, you know, I, I had it the other way, I had so many years of racing and then I got, I was like, okay, I've covered every inch of that turf that I need to. And then it was like, well, what has purpose for me now? And for me, it's, it's really to just exercise every day, you know, to get out and do something doesn't have to be hard. Doesn't have to be long. Doesn't have to be intense. And, um, but just to, honor my body by moving. And like you said, uh, you know, to be thankful that you can get out and you can swim and you can bike and you can run, you can surf, you can do yoga, you can do whatever it is that you like to do. You can walk and to honor your life and life itself by moving. Human beings are meant to move. Mm -hmm. You know, we are not meant to sit for 10 hours straight in front of a computer screen. We are meant to just roam and move throughout the entire day. And sometimes, you know, I feel like I have athletic ADD or something because I have athletic induced ADD because, you know, I'll be front in front of my computer. And all of a sudden I can feel everything just go, zzz, you know, it's like, I have to go walk down to the ocean for 10 minutes and then come back and then continue on. And I, I just think there's a hard wiring in our DNA that is like, get up and move, come on, get up and move. And when we ignore that, that's when everything gets dulled, those senses of how to take care of ourselves get shut off a little bit. And then we stop hearing those signals of what to eat and how much sleep we need and how much exercise will actually help us to feel really good and vibrant. And that kind of works in the other direction. But the more we just keep that consistency going, you know, and so for you, you, re you reverse engineered, you got races on the calendar. Me, I, I love it because of consistency, it's a personal thing. Other people will, will engage, uh, you know, uh, an exercise group to meet on certain days so that they have that accountability and they, you feel responsible to that. And in the end, it does the same thing. It keeps all of us kind of on that consistent movement. And that is where true good health comes from. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm also curious, you know, as a coach now, like as you sort of came up, you didn't, it doesn't, from what I know, didn't really have like a coach that you went to, but you worked with different people like Brandt and Phil Maffetone and, um, you know, would go in and do some testing with like VO2 max. And, you know, you used all these different sort of tools and methods. So is that all sort of become part of what you're able to share and help direct with athletes now? Yeah. You know, like I said, I've been in endurance athletics for over 40 years now. And, um, I tried just about every training paradigm you could come up with ones that made sense and one that seemed ones that seemed completely far out. And, uh, you know, over the years I've seen what actually lives up to the promise of what it says it can do. And the one, then the things that might be, might work great for four weeks or six weeks, and then you blow up if you keep going at it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I've distilled things down to with the people that I coach at, at Mark Allen coaching is, what I feel are, are like the real core essentials to getting fit, staying healthy, having great race performances, avoiding injury, avoiding the pitfalls of overtraining and being able to, you know, consistently improve year after year after year. Like some coaching paradigms that are very different from mine, you'll get fit really quick the way they have you training with a lot of intensity and hard stuff. and. Um, but then after a year, year and a half, you're going to be completely burned out. And for me, it's more like, maybe this will be a lifestyle for you. Maybe it won't be, but I am going to coach you from the standpoint of it being something that you can do year after year after year and improve and not get burned out and, and see results. So from day to day, you won't see a whole lot, but over the course of three, four months, six months, a year, two years, three years, you're going to see this like progression, like, oh, wow look, and I didn't feel like I was really doing much, you know, or I wasn't, didn't feel like I was pushing myself to the limit all the time, like I was with that other, other person that was helping me, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, my coaching is part experience, part science, uh, part personal, um, seeing what actually really works and also seeing what works for people, because everybody is a little bit different. And so mm -hmm. um, how, how they apply the, the principles that I provide uh, depends on the person a little bit too. Yeah. So I think like in terms of that prospect, that process and sort of the perspective on it, you know, I think in your own story, you know, you signed up for your first Ironman, like half a year away sort of thing and felt like that was plenty of time to, to get ready for it. And a little bit similar with myself, like I'm doing my first 70.3 in December and I started really training at the beginning of this year. And, um, you know, by that time I want to be like in absolute peak, you know, fitness and, and, and performance ready. But in reality, especially when it comes to something like endurance sport, there is a real, you know, long scope building of the aerobic system, getting the, di the diet and nutrition right, how much can you train without overtraining, let alone all the other stresses in life, you know, is it, and our culture is so impatient, you know, we want everything now, like I want to be ready to race next week. If I trained all week, why am I not like, you know, in amazing shape already? Mm -hmm. Is that something that you see with athletes you work with or beyond that is, you know, a constant sort of reminder of that sort of perspective and like the long-term view? Yeah. You know, I have never yet met a triathlete that I have to motivate. <laughs> you know, I, if anything, 99% of them, I have to have them put on the brakes and slow it down a little bit and like, you know, like, okay, <laughs> temper the enthusiasm a little bit. Let's pace this over, you know, this year and next year when you're going from an Olympic distance to a half to a full type of thing, you know, for sure you can go in one year from doing very little to completing a, a half Ironman um, because your starting point and where you'll end up after six, eight, 10 months is, is going to be a dramatic difference. Mm -hmm. But then if you also approach it sort of like, well, that's just going to be the first step and then I'll keep going after that, then maybe you won't try to ramp quite as quickly Mm -hmm. but then after that one, then you'll continue to build and build and build. And, you know, endurance athletics is that kind of thing where you really do get about 80% of your, your fitness in the first three, four, five months of training. And, and then after that, that last 20% kind 
comes much slower, but that last little bit is also what makes a huge difference in the races. Mm -hmm. And the same thing, if you think of it in, in long, uh, long term, you know, the first couple of years are where you're going to make these real dramatic improvements from where you started. But then it's, it's the years after that, where you make those little subtle changes and improvements that ultimately make these huge, have these huge impacts on not only how you race, but your experience of, of the races themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. And for me, it was like, you know, a good place to start and shoot for. And it's funny because I think myself a few years ago would have been like, well, I'm doing a full Ironman this year, you know, and just go full blast. But so it felt like do, starting with a, signing up for a half, you know, and doing a shorter one earlier in the year is like, you know, that's the measured approach. And like, I've signed up doing like a online training program and I went for like level one, you know, I didn't try and kid myself into thinking I was beyond that. So I feel like I'm like, okay, I'm doing this so I can do it for the rest of my life if I want to, not just to, you know, hobble over the finish line this one time. But uh, it's still, even with that and like bringing that sort of conscious patience to it, it's still challenging for sure. I still want yep. to be there tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you're not alone, you know, yeah. and, and if I said that I never pushed it too hard too many times in a row, you know, because I want to get there quicker, I'd be lying. You know, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. You know, I have that little bit of hard wire, wiring that at points was very impatient. Mm -hmm. But then ultimately I saw what that got me and that was not good, you know. And so yeah. finally it's like, okay. And then I, you know, I, I, I did follow Phil Maffetone's sort of approach with heart rate training and developing a lot of the aerobic capacity physiology before you really dive into the anaerobic. And, um, you know, at first I had to, really dial things way back from where I'd been training because I, I came from a swimming background where basically everything was anaerobic and fast and hard and just pushing yourself day after day. And I thought, okay, that's what I have to do cycling and running. And that was killing me. And so, you know, first, first times that he started working with me, he said, okay, we're going to put on a heart rate monitor, have you run on a track and, and we're going to see how, what your pace is at 155 beats a minute. He said, he said, that's right at the top of your aerobic um, metabolism. And if you go above that, then it goes anaerobic. And we want to develop that aerobic fat burning metabolism. And so, you know, we stuck this heart rate monitor on, which was like this ancient device compared to what we have now. And literally, I felt like I was barely moving and it was already at 155 beats a minute. And the pace I had to go was about three or three and a half minutes slower than I tried to hit on every one of my runs. And so I'm thinking, this is how slow I'm gonna have to go. Are you frigging kidding me? You know, at this pace, I won't be able to beat guys at twice my age. And he said, trust me, you know? And so he said for the next, the, the next month, do everything aerobic. And at the end of that, which I did, and I slowed things down and my training partners hated me because, <laughs> you know, on every bike ride, when we got to a hill, I was way off the back and I was no fun to train with anymore. And then we had a race. It was a half Ironman distance race on Kauai and it was in December. And um, I went to the race. I just did like one week of speed work leading up to it. And I crushed. I had one of the best performances I'd ever had. And I'm like, where did that come from? This is working, you know, and that really gave me that confidence to just stick with it. And you know, I saw a lot of my training partners, they, they saw how it was working for me. And so they'd stick a heart rate monitor on and they'd slow down for about a week or week and a half and go, ah, oh, screw it. You know, I'm, mm -hmm. my body's different than his, you know, and then they go back to doing their normal stuff and they never got that long gradual improvement. Whereas I pretty much got faster every single year throughout my career of 15 years of racing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I stayed relatively injury free, nothing that sideline me for more than you know taking a, a couple days easy so I, you know, yeah. I feel fortunate in the, on that level too yeah yeah that's been like a big part of my training and what got me excited as well part part of it was like oh this is an excuse to go slow to start with i don't have to come out and try and run the same pace i was running a couple of years ago mm -hmm. um but you know a lot of it as well like we talked about that sort of sense of really getting to know yourself i find is really like correlated with trusting your heart. And I sort of like you view that as sort of the compass for my sort of truer self in a way. 
which is really like quite hard to quantify. Um, so by using the heart rate monitor for training, it was this way to sort of quantify being able to trust your heart and know that it knows better than your mind is going to know. And if somebody blasts past you on a run or a ride, you know, you just continue to stay within yourself and trust your heart and, you know, try and take that into other areas of my life as well. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, on my coaching, I, all of the people's Garmin data or whatever uploads directly into the calendar that we all use. And mm -hmm. um, so I can see what's going on on every workout and, you know, I'll, it'll be like, okay, your average heart rate was great, but you had this super high top end heart rate that was way over your aerobic max. What, did something happen there? And it's always like, well, yeah, this guy passed me and I just couldn't let him go or, you know, or whatever, you know? So yeah. it's like, I go, I get it. You know, it's, you, you don't want to be a robot either, but yeah. at the same, at the same time, um, if you do kind of adhere to just some pretty simple principles of training the results day to day will be very, um, uh, non-impressive but over time you'll kind of go oh wow like I have a, a woman who trains in Florida and today she goes you know a couple months ago when I started with you I thought this is this is crazy I'm having to go so slow she goes now I'm going faster than I was running before and my heart rate is you know 20 beats lower than it was going slower she said it's just amazing how how this really works you know those are I love hearing stuff like that from people that I work with so yeah, that's definitely good. So I had a, a bit of a wake up call. I had a really overtrained week about three weeks ago and I set off on a bike ride um, and I hit a pothole that I ride around every day and crash my bike. And in hindsight, it was really like, you know what? I was feeling really tired. My, I was not being present and it ended up, you know, it's been painful. It was three weeks ago and I'm still, I'm just getting back on the bike now. Um, but it was this big wake up call in terms of, you know, coming, you know, having an injury, hurting my shoulder and wrist and not really not being able to swim, um, due to overtraining really. And just like that sort of lack of awareness and presence, mm -hmm. but you know, when that happens, you know, and injury does happen obviously to many athletes, um, how is that something that you've overcome in your career, um, with, with more of the sort of bigger injuries, like if you've had a bike crash and, and broken something and, and, you know, the accepting reality and then moving forward from there. Well, the one big bike crash I had was, um, in 1992, I'd, I'd won three Ironman world championships at that point, 1989, 1991. And I was training, hopefully hoping to win the fourth one in 92. And it was the last day of winter. And I went out for a long ride it was by myself and it was the same thing kind of like i wasn't in the mood and i was kind of I, I was in a foul mood and i just wasn't into it and you know 15 miles into the ride i went through an intersection and, the, and this truck truck just turned right into me and i went up on the hood and down on the ground and completely broke my collarbone and it, it felt like it knocked my life out of me for a second you know it was it was like otherworldly in a sense and uh, so there I am laying on the ground. I'm like, I'm fine. I stood up and I could hear this, you know. And so they took me to the emergency room and, you know, ambulance came, took me to the emergency room. I'm sitting there for like two hours on this gurney. And finally this doctor comes up and she goes, is somebody going to take you home? And I go, nobody's even seen me yet. And she's like, oh, you know. <laughs> so anyway, put me in a sling and all that. So that. The thing about it was that uh, two things happened. One, um, I, I looked, I was, as I was sitting there on that gurney, it's like, you know what? I didn't listen. I was tired. I mm -hmm. was not motivated. And there was that little voice that was just saying, don't, don't do this long ride today. And I didn't listen because I was a slave to my training plan. So that was, that was lesson number one. And then that night I was, I was, sitting on my couch and I was watching a movie, Edward Scissorhands about this, you know, with Johnny Depp and he's yep. this guy who's completely misunderstood by everybody, but he's got this amazing gift to, you know, do these shrubbery things with his scissors hands. So anyway, right toward the end of the movie, 
I, um, I had to go to the bathroom. So I paused it and I walked into the bathroom, you know, with my arm in the sling. And the next thing I know, I am, it's like I was traveling through this back through some tube and I hear these voices and all of a sudden I, I open my eyes and I look up and I'm looking up at this white thing and I'm like, what's that? And I realized it was the toilet and I had passed out and I felt all this moisture on my head and I went like this and I, I, I had all this blood. I'd passed out, smashed my head on the toilet. And so now I've got to make my second trip to the emergency room on the same day. Oh. And I called my brother and he came and he picked me up and you know we went to the emergency room. And um, after that second thing where I smashed my head, I broke. I, I completely cracked. You know, I just I started I was sitting there and I just started crying like why am I doing this? Why am I racing? Why does this have any meaning? I couldn't come up with one reason why I wanted to go back and win a race, why I wanted to do any other, any races anymore. And it's like, I felt like I was floating between worlds and it, and it, it took, it took a couple of weeks. And finally I sort of got grounded again and realized, you know what I've, I've won three Ironmans. I don't need to go back there to win, but I do need to go back there because I know there's more that I can put out on that race course. There's more that I can bring to it and give to it and show to the world. And that has importance for me. And so the, the, the thought, those next three years that I raced Kona, that was the reason I went back because I felt like there was something more inside of me that, that could be brought out through that race. And that had huge meaning. And that's a very different kind of purpose than going there to win a race, mm -hmm. you know, sort of like winning a race is sort of a, it's almost a self, it's like a, a self oriented goal, mm -hmm. but going there to bring something out that's inside for the world felt like something that was something that I wanted to put out just to give to the world. Maybe, one person might be motivated by what they saw me do on race day. And if it changed their life to get up off the couch, that would be worth it for me. And that was why I went back those, those last, those second three that I won for a total of six wins. Mm -hmm. um, so you just never know where, what's going to happen through something that is, you could look at as adversity or a bad, a bad accident or something like that. Yeah. Maybe there's going to be a new perspective that comes that, really will carry you forward in a way that you never would have been able to come up with or discover had things just kind of gone status quo. Yeah. Yeah. As hard as it can be, it is, there is always an opportunity in those times of adversity. I wonder, um, like for you, it, you know, with that such a shift uh, internally and in approaching those second three races, what was the experience like? How is it different? It was, there was less stress, there was less anxiety and worry and uh, much more um, a sense like it, there, there was nothing that could, could happen out there on the race course that would take anything away from me. You know, if you're trying to win, there's kind of, there can be that sense like if I don't win, something's taken from me. Like mm -hmm. somebody, else, somebody else took the victory and I couldn't grab it. Mm -hmm. But on those, the, on those second three going into the race, I just felt like there's, there's no outcome of this day that, that is, would be anything would, that, where something would be taken from me because of a result that maybe wasn't a first place. And so it really felt like um, a sense of invincibility in the sense of there was no, there would, there was no possibility of a bad outcome from the day, mm -hmm. no matter what the finish would be, mm -hmm. and that was a very different feeling, you know. I, and I guess that's sort of like an ultimate trust in life, in a, in a way. Yeah. Well, it just makes me feel like you're honoring yourself and the race and the island, and in such a more, yeah, a deeper way of surrender. Like you said, it's much more selfless um you know i wonder as you as you coach people is that something that you try to integrate into the process for people or do you find an individual is going to have to sort of come to that place on their own 
you know, most people that come to me, they, they, they want the swim, bike, run workouts and, mm -hmm. you know, and that's where I start them. And then usually something comes up either in their personal life or in their training or, in, or in a race where it starts to go, starts to hit those little deeper points of something in there that needs to be transformed or changed or learned about. And that's when, you know, an opportunity, usually opportunities open up for me to, um, provide a, a bigger perspective and to have them find a, um, a broader sense of themselves that they can either bring into this or a reason or a purpose that's very different than they thought of why they were there doing the sport. And, and those are really fun shifts when they do happen. Yeah, I can imagine that would be exciting for you and not something that every coach is able to probably offer in the same way too um you know i find all sport is you know has incredible capacity for growth and learning and life lessons but it does feel like endurance sport and something like a ironman triathlon you know has a little bit extra of that opportunity you know you have so much time alone so much time in training the consistency required um the opportunity for spending a lot of time in dark places and sort of getting that mind trained as well as the body. Do you find that there's something specific about endurance sport that, you know, does that for people or you see people drawn to for any reason? Well, when you're in a race that can last eight, 15, 17 hours, you, you, you do have a lot of time where you're, you're dealing with yourself. You know, you do a, a hundred meter dash, you know, if you're good, you're, you're getting that thing done in 10 seconds. So it takes you 10 seconds to do your race. And then you talk about it for the next <laughs> rest of your life, right? Triath triathlon, you know, Ironman lasts 17 hours and then you're too tired to talk about it. <laughs> so, um, I think it's just the, you know, I always tell people that it, if you go into, let's say an Ironman and you're all pumped up and you have that, ah, I, I've got this kind of thing that sort of bravado self-confidence has a shelf life of about three hours. And after about three hours of racing, you start to get worn down. And then it's like, Ooh, Oh, I'm starting to feel the reality of what I got myself into. And then uh, after about another hour, you're just like, okay, <laughs> now I'm dealing with myself here. And it's, it, this is, this is not a fantasy. This is a reality. And I have to start managing my thoughts, my emotions, my expectations, and see how I can build from a very basic core level of my self mm -hmm. outward here. And so it just, it just gives you more time. And so I think it does afford a huge amount of um, chance to sort of self-reflect. And it might not be in the race. It might be months or even years after you've completed it that you actually think about it. Like I, you know, I'm still learning stuff from my years of racing when I think about some of the pieces that went into the performance or what happened in the race, or it's like, oh, okay, that's what was really going on. You know, that's why I didn't win those first six years. And then I made that shift, whatever, which is cool. You know, mm -hmm. I wrote a book called The Art of Competition. And in that, um, it, it, the core of it are 90 quotes that I wrote that do talk about personal excellence and overcoming challenge and, and uh, how do you manage adversity and finding peace and all those kind of things. And each quote is paired with this beautiful photo from nature. So it's like you look at, you know, nature is such a universal place, like, wow, that's beautiful kind of thing. And then you put these very simple quotes. It really does enable you to kind of think about sport in a different way that it, maybe it is more than just sport. Maybe it truly can become something that's like art. And mm -hmm. um, you can, you can get that on Amazon as a, as an ebook. Um, but anyway, the last chapter uh, I wrote, an, I, so there's the quotes and then there's six different chapters with things like fear and challenge. And the last chapter was titled art. And that book, that chapter, I, I want it to be, um, a retelling of my first and my final Ironman victories, because those two bookend races were really the two that defined my career. The first was overcoming so much 
to finally get there. And then that last one was overcoming a de deficit of 13 and a half minutes at the end of the bike to actually go on and win uh, by running the, the guy down who was leading on the marathon. And I was 37 years old at the time, which nobody had won as a 37 year old. So it was like a very, it was the most challenging of all the Ironman victories. But anyway, I had told those stories about a thousand times by the time I was writing this book. And so I sat down at the computer for like a month to write the final chapter in the art of competition, the chapter called art, my transformation from taking sport to an art form and no words would come out. And I'd sit there and it's like, it's blank. I got this word document open and there's not one friggin' word on it. And I'm like, if I can't write this chapter, this book doesn't exist, you know? And uh, I, was, I was completely stumped. And then one day I went out surfing and it was a beautiful day and there weren't that many guys and it wasn't a heavy day or anything. It was just fun. And I was sitting just outside where most of the guys are sitting. And it's like, if you're just outside of everybody, you're looking out at the ocean and it's like, you've got the whole ocean to yourself. It's like, it's you and the ocean. And I was kind of just daydreaming and all of a sudden it came how to tell those stories in a way that I'd never told them before. And I'm like, oh my God. And I took a wave, I came in and I sat down and I had typed that, that last chapter out in a couple of hours. And um, so anyway, um, you know, it was just a, it was just a way to, for me to see that um, sport can be sport or it can be so much more. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the lessons we learn from it might not come to us in the immediate moment of the experience, but if we reflect back and think about it, there's going to be things that can impact your life in a very positive way for the rest of your life through sports, through training, through the evolution of who you become, through the challenges and endurance sports to bring full circle, endurance athletics and endurance sports gives you a lot of time to learn some lessons because the training does take longer. And so you have time where you're thinking, even if you're in a group, you're still out there for a long time on the long days. And it just affords you time to kind of learn about life. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess it really does allow you to get your, get to know yourself in a new way. And even as you were talking about it and sort of the ego can get you through the first three hours and then there's a level of discomfort that might settle in. And, you know, it makes me think about, you know, the spiritual journey as well, like having done the Vipassana, um, having done some isolation retreats. Um, I think I read that you had done sort of like a vision quest uh, at some point as well. You know, is there a similarity or a parallel there where, you know, just that amount of time alone with yourself and your mind in this, in that state where there's um, that sort of exploration? Yeah, I've, you know, I've done Vision Quest with Brant and, um, you know, you're out there for one day, two day, three day, four day without, without food and without water, you know, you're in one spot and there's a very specific protocol on how everything works and, you know, you only do it with a shaman like that. Um, it's like a very, it's like a 24 hour meditation each day. You know, it's, it's very focused and very, and very, um, expansive on your awareness. And it, you, you, you really see more the reality, I think of what life is made of and, and what makes life and how you connect with it. And, um, yeah, it was, it was actually after the first vision quest that I did, um, it was two years, it was two years after my first Ironman win and it was a two day vision quest and, and on the flight home, it was up in Wyoming. I thought there is, there is no way anybody will ever beat me again in Kona because of what I was able to tap into. And it wasn't like I'm, I, I wasn't studying with Brant to win races. I wasn't mm -hmm. studying with him to be a better triathlete. I was studying with him and I still study with him, uh, as a way to improve my life and to have a better experience of life and to give more back to life. And it was just like this awareness, like there's, there's nothing anybody's doing in their training that comes anywhere close to what I just did, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I don't say it as from an ego standpoint or from a, I've got this standpoint because I knew mm -hmm. that I, 
I could have that awareness, but at the same time, I still had to put in all that hard work and I still had to go there each year and figure out how to win each race on the days that unfolded. You know, it's so easy to figure out how you would have won last year's race, right. you know, but to win this year's race is a, always a completely new experience. So. Yeah. And in terms of that sort of progressive growth and your journey, you know, you talked about your last race being the, the most challenging and now, you know, coming off the bike that far behind at 37, you know, all of these things that nobody had ever done. Do you feel like as you've sort of grown as a, as a human being and your capacity for challenge has grown that the sort of universe brings you bigger challenges to overcome? <laughs> Well, it does seem like um, some of the stuff I've had to deal with um, in the past years is way more challenging than anything I had to manage in Ironman. And I often reflect back and go like, okay, you know, if, if this was, if I'm going to draw the parallels here, what, what did I learn and how can I apply that right here and now in this new situation that I've never thought I'd have to deal with before? And you know that's just life, right? You you make it through one challenging thing, and it's like, okay, it's not smooth sailing forever. You get something else will come up, and I don't go looking for challenge because mm -hmm. life is plenty good at providing challenges yeah. to you. Um, but again, you know, ultimately it all comes down to the perspective. It's like none of this is good or bad. It's just how you how you approach it, how you react to it, how you respond to it. So as best as I can, I try to look at all of the the really tough things that i've had to deal with and that everybody has to deal with and go okay opportunity for learning and opportunity for um using what i've gained in my life to this point to deal with this and an opportunity to maybe enrich somebody else's life by what i'm doing to help them you know well, on a little bit of a shift, I feel like I have to ask you a little bit about nutrition. Um, you know, like over training and under training, there is some sort of sweet spot with nutrition. And like you mentioned, everyone is individual. So everyone also is like, there's no one size fits all for that. But are there any sort of foundational learnings from your own experience and as a coach that you can share on that? Like, I guess I, I ask it as I sort of get back into endurance after, you know, I, I had an ACL surgery a couple of years ago. So it's been easing back into real proper like running and, and cycling now. But in that time, you know, I've sort of gotten sucked into some of the more dogmatic diets, uh, like a ketogenic diet or things like that, which it seems like just don't work very well when it comes to endurance sports. So the idea of like eating breakfast to me is a hard thing to swallow, no pun, no pun in, semi intended. But, you know, I'm curious to know, like, as you coach people and then your experience over your career, what were some of the sort of foundational pieces that you see as, as really important when it comes to nutrition? Well, if a diet seems extreme, it's probably not going to work. <laughs> it, might, it might have a short term benefit, but in, in the long haul, uh, there's usually a, a downfall or a drawback. And in the long run, if it's an extreme diet, you probably won't stick with it unless, you're, unless your entire livelihood is, is based on espousing this particular diet, you know? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I, just a couple foundational things to kind of think about. You know, if you try to take away all of the, take, eliminate the foods that, that you might purchase that are, artificially high taste foods mm -hmm. to have, you know, added flavorings, even if they're natural flavorings, you know, if you take all of that out and if you pretty much eliminate sugar, your body's going to get really good at telling you what it needs to eat to, to be healthy and to be nourished and to replenish and repair everything that gets broken down during training. Mm -hmm. and the more you do that, the more you don't want the, the junk. But if you have super high taste foods, you know, think Doritos ranch style ch tortilla chips, right? Mm -hmm. Got like every high taste flavoring in the universe on there. You crave it, you know, no matter how many you eat, you still want to have more of them, you know? But if you eat raw almonds, you know, you're going to have some and then you're going to be done. You, you don't 
you, you don't sit down and eat five pounds of raw almonds. You would sit down and eat five pounds of ranch style Dorito chips or whatever, you know. So <clears throat> start by just eliminating all the stuff with that add super high taste added stuff. That doesn't mean you have to eat bland. You can use natural spices, you know, peppers and uh, cumin and spices that, that, that are actual actually from nature to make your food taste good. Um, and then the second thing is to, to try to eat foods that, that are super um, high nutrient density. You know, if you, if you're eating foods that are low nutrient density, your body's going to be constantly craving all the stuff that's not in there and you'll stay hungry. Mm -hmm. But if the food you eat is super high nutrient density, your body's going to get more of the stuff it needs and your appetite will turn off and you, you keep things in balance. And then, like I said, that third thing is just really try to, to cut out eliminated uh, um, any kind of added sugar because that, that just, um, you know, it causes inflammation, it causes blood sugar swings, it, it causes craving, food craving, you know, so, and then just keep things kind of balanced. Look at what's on the plate. Is there a good source of carbohydrate? Is there a good source of oils and fats? Is there a good source of protein? And, you know, fine tune the ratios of those based on your body and what you're doing with your exercise. Somebody who's not exercising will have need a different ratio of those three core things and somebody who's exercising a lot. Mm -hmm. And like if somebody is doing triathlon and say they're doing like sprint and Olympic versus somebody who's doing Ironman, it's really going to be just more of a quantity difference in terms of just being able to fuel that difference in training quantity. It'll, it'll be quantity. And the more, um, the more volume you do, the more um, overall carbohydrate you're going going to have to eat in your diet compared to fat and protein mm -hmm. just because you're, you're burning through a lot more of that because of your workouts and also also because of uh, lean muscle re you know when you repair muscle a lot of that process takes place through the energy of, of, of glucose being broken down so that doesn't mean that you can go you know drink a bunch of cokes or whatever but it just means that your overall your daily percentage on a high volume training will be probably a little bit more carbohydrate than somebody who's just doing like a sprint type, you know, or 5k or whatever. Right. So, um, on the triathlon front, like, how do you, are you pretty involved in watching what's going on today? You know, races are kind of getting back going again. Somebody like Ian Fredino is, you know, pretty incredible to watch. How do you feel about the sort of current state of the sport? Yeah. You know, I'm, a uh, there's a, the PTO, the professional triathlon organization, triathlete organization that is helping uh, sort of try to elevate the level of the pros. And um, so I'm involved with their championship race that'll take place in August over in Europe. It's called the Collins Cup. Anyway, um, yeah, the level of, of, of pro is super high. You know, you have Jan Fredino, you've got Daniela Reef, you've got you know, there's never a shortage of really good athletes. And as technology evolves and training devices evolve, you know, they've really been able to fine tune a lot of the training. So it's exciting to see. There's a lot of names that are only names that I've seen in results because of so many races and so many athletes. I've, a lot of them I've never even seen or met in person. So sometimes that's hard because you want to know everybody, but you, you only know a handful that are consistently racing and consistently you see photos of them or you actually see them at races and talk to them. And, um, but yeah, it's, it'll be interesting to see how this, this year unfolds. I th probably a lot of athletes will not return to race who were professional because they just couldn't do it financially. And they're probably looking at like, okay, what's next, you know? Yeah. You know, you mentioned uh, like technology, um, obviously with, with bikes and running shoes and, and different things like that. You know, when you got into the sport, it was very early days, but it sounds like you were one of the, you know, first people who had opportunities to start trying different technologies and see how that evolved. You know, how do you sort of, do, does that make a big difference or, and how do you balance that with, you know, getting to know yourself in terms of what foods to eat in terms of how hard to push myself? Um, yeah, I'm curious to know your thoughts on that, I guess. 
Well, technology is great, um, especially in the beginning of when somebody's training because it can help them match an experience or feeling that they're having with some of what's actually going on in their body. Over time though, it, it's also important to really develop your intuitive sense of your body, what you need to eat, how much of each fat, carbohydrate, protein you're gonna need in each meal and every meal is gonna be different. And how hard is too hard before you start to go over the over training edge and start to get, you know, really it's, you're not recovering and you're getting burned out, you know? I mean, you can use your, your uh, HRV device, get your heart rate variability and, you know, see how much time you spent in REM sleep last night and all that. But the other side is, I think one of the reasons why um, a lot of the times that we did way back in the eighties and nineties at Ironman and Kona anyway, is, is kind of on par, you know, especially if you considered a lot of the technology and biking that saves time and all that. Um, one of the reasons that there haven't been huge gains and jumps is that all we had to rely on was that intuitive sense. And that's super smart, mm -hmm. you know? And, and so I think that if an athlete can sort of use the metrics and develop that self-awareness, that's going to be the, that's going to be the magical mix of, of the best of both worlds. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, the, the technology of the human body is so far beyond anything we've been able to make. So if you're able to tap into that more and not be dependent on technology or dependent on a coach to tell you what to do, that is going to be, you know, the best way forward, I imagine. Um, when we, when we first started talk, talking, um, we were talking about strength training and using the tonal, which is obviously a pretty interesting sort of technological advance that's really taken off in the last year with, with COVID and gyms shutting down. Um, but also with strength training, it, you know, you were among the first in the triathlete space to embrace that as a part of, uh, you know, like a foundational part of your training as well. And um, I'm curious, like, it seems like that's been a thing that's come all the way through from, from training then to your weekly workouts now. Yeah, I started using strength training on a real regular basis when I was, um, when I was 34. And um, up until that point, I was able to kind of escape without being very regular. And then I, there was like this real switch. And I knew that I had to, to develop Get, get strength training to be a part of what I did on a consistent basis throughout the year. And so, you know, and, and that's something that's carried over even today. I love my tonal, you know, it's, it's set up, it's, it's a great device for being able to do every kind of strength move that you would do in a gym, but it's in your home and it's, it's very, it, it learns how you're moving, how you're lifting. So if, if it's too heavy, it'll dial it back the next time. If you do the set and it, it's, you did it very easily. It'll up the, the weight the next time. Anyway, it's a, it's such an important piece of um, human physiology to develop that muscular strength. It's just like you need cardio and you need strength. And if you have those two working together, then no matter what sport you're doing, whether it's a real strength sport or a real cardio sport, you're going to be a better athlete and a more resilient athlete and a more effective athlete. And if you're, if you're talking about lifestyle, especially as you age, you know, obviously you need cardiovascular fitness and you definitely need that strength training to maintain lean muscle that keeps, keeps your balance up. It keeps your, your, your joints and tendons and ligaments strong. So you don't have joint issues, keeps you from, so that you can still function in life, you know, so you can actually pick up the bag of groceries and carry them in the house and not have to stress about it, that kind of thing. Yeah, I think it gets overlooked, you know, even just on a neurological level, how it can keep you sharp mentally. Do you find that there's still uh, resistance to strength training in, in a sport like triathlon or are people pretty universally accepted it now? It's much more universally accepted now than it was before. And a lot of it has come because of uh, some of the, the core strength training and functional strength work that, that has become very popular and, and effective. Um, and because people are able to, you know, have a lot of this stuff set up in their house. So they don't have to necessarily take more time out of, the, out of their day to go do a strength workout in a gym or in a club. Mm -hmm. Um, not that that's bad, but, uh, it, you know, time management is a reality for 
you know, people who are working and they're still trying to do an Ironman or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's not like every triathlete does strength training, but a, mm -hmm. a much higher percentage of them do strength training now than when I was racing for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, to finish it off today, I know I'm curious to know, you know, what you're excited about sort of this year looking forward, you know, with the COVID situation, things, especially in California, seem feeling a little bit more open. Um, you mentioned you've got a workshop back on for, for September this year. Um, anything else you're sort of excited about getting back into or, or looking forward to? Well, I'm just excited to see racing come back and to um, start to see see what kind of secret training a lot of the top folks have been doing, you know, because some of them will, they'll be doing what you expect and there's going to be some people that are going to pop up in that first top three in, in races. You're like, who's that? What were they doing? You know, <laughs> so, and that's always exciting. And then for me personally, you know, I, I can't wait to um, hopefully get back to, uh, you know, not, not only the Collins Cup, which is going to take place in August in Europe, but then also the Ironman 70.3 and Ironman World Championship events. September will be the half Ironman in St. George and then obviously Kona in, in October. Um, it was very odd to not be in Kona last October because I've been every year since 1982, except for one uh, for the race. And so that part, that rhythm of my life was mm -hmm. like, it's not there. It's... <laughs> You know, that day came and went and nobody raced. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that must be strange. I mean, it's such a significant, you know, aside from the six wins, all the other times you've raced it, you know, those are like monumental days in your life, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. Watching not only the pros, but also just the whole experience and the age mm -hmm. group athletes coming across and the people that are finishing just before midnight and the people that, you know, have been dreaming about doing that race for years and they finally qualify or get there and, you know, to just see them coming down that finish shoot on Elite Drive and just with that, that look on their face, like, you know, I did it, you know, yeah. it's, and it's a great experience because that event combines everything, you know, it's, it's community, it's, you know, coming through that finish line with thousands of people cheering, but it's also, a day where you're out there by yourself for many hours, even though there's racers around you, you're on your own, you know, you're dealing with it. You're, you're, you're interacting with that Island, you know, and like I said, surfing's great. Cause it's this very visceral physical interaction with the energy of nature on the, you know, the waves moving, this water's moving and Ironman's kind of like that almost on a, feels like on an energetic level because it's, I mean, it's, you get the sun, the heat from the sun, you've got wind on the bike, you've got humidity, you've got this heat coming up from the lava, from the, the, the pavement, and you've got the this unseen energy of the big island that is just seeping through everything. And it's sort of like, a, it's sort of like a truth serum. You know, it's like, it shows mm -hmm. you everything about yourself, the good, the bad, the ugly. And it's like, then you got to, you, it's up to you to deal with it. But at the same time, the island is also very, um, embracing in the sense that like it doesn't really let you fall too far you know right so that's great yeah well i can imagine that that sort of community sense like no matter you're at the front of the pack or you're coming in right at the end like it's a significant event in anyone's life to go through that and to to endure that sort of experience with so many people even though you're not talking with them you know on longer races myself or longer rides there's a bond that's that's shared in that, in that experience. That's you know, hard to describe, but really powerful. Yeah. Yeah. Should awesome. be a great year. Yeah, definitely. Well, thanks again for your time. And it's been awesome to connect and get to ask you some questions. I really appreciate it. All right. My pleasure. And good luck uh, on your journey to that 70.3. Can't wait Thank to you. <laughs> see how it goes. Yeah. I'll let you know. Awesome. Thanks again. All right. Take care. Take care.